Madana Mohana Murari Madana Mohana Murari Adibo Namaste and welcome. Uh, we are going to be um, doing a number of talks on the subject of bhakti. Um, in this, uh, in these talks, we are going to try and present an authentic understanding of bhakti and why it is described as the culmination of yoga. So in this first talk, we are going to be dealing with bhakti, what it is and what it is not. The understanding that I will attempt to share is derived from authentic and ancient truth that is propounded by Veda Vyasa in the the one who compiled the Vedas 5000 years ago our attempt to speak on this is with the authority of what is called Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. Guru meaning the great spiritual masters, uh, the ancient sages within the different authoritative lineages and of course Shastra, which refers to the Vedic teachings. Um, it has become kind of common for people to um, want to sort of present their own ideas. Oh, this is how I understand something or this is what I think it should be or what I think it is. And this type of, of mentality or this type of attitude was not how since ancient times these spiritual teachings were received. The subject of bhakti is also a product, in order to be able to really appreciate it, it is a product of um, spiritual realization. This is not an academic exercise or a mental undertaking. Um, Self-realization is meant to be going beyond the mind. The mind is understood to be a tool which the living being can and should use. But if one is simply being motivated and moved by their mind, then one will have difficulty ascertaining what is actually the truth. So you'll see in the modern era there is this tendency to think that academics are authorities on spiritual matters. I say that without um, wanting in any way to be critical, but this is, is the, the tendency. And it's often easier to do this, to turn to academic authorities as being authorities, than to engage in the actual pursuit of finding a true transcendentalist. A, when we say this term spiritual master, it refers to one who has mastered 
spiritual world, the spiritual understanding. And if I am to seek out such a person, it puts a huge um, burden upon myself. So it's kind of easier just to sort of like want to go to some university or some buddy who's written a book without really considering what is that person's situation or position. If a person is living a life of absorption in the senses and in the temporary changing world where your reality is founded on the illusion that I am this body, I am male, I am female, I am of certain racial extraction, I am a certain age, etc. and etc. Then it becomes truly not realistic to expect that if I'm living in that consciousness that I will be able to um, appreciate that which is truly transcendental. There is another concept in yoga, it's not just a concept in terms of idea, but there is another understanding within yoga of what is called maya or illusion. The reality that the living beings, when they are covered by material misconception, they are existing in a state of illusion. And unless or until one is able to get beyond this filter, this illusory filter, then my perceptions, my understandings of things will be very much affected or colored by this filter. And I'm saying this not as a criticism. Um, it is for the purpose of trying to share with um, genuine seekers of the truth that these very much need to be factored into my search for the truth, the spiritual or transcendental truth. So I've stated before in another talk and this one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam which confirms this. It says, whenever a person experiences by self-realization that both the gross and subtle bodies have nothing to do with the pure self, at that time he sees himself as well as the Lord or the highest truth. So in order to perceive that which is true, it's not a question of having a powerful brain or mind and being scholarly or trained in scholastic pursuit. This is more about a journey seeking to remove the filters and the illusion that we exist in and seeing with stunning clarity that which is transcendental. So when we speak of bhakti as being the culmination of yoga, right away you're going to get sort of like two, often, no, often you will right away get two types of responses to that. People that are identifying themselves with a particular yoga path other than bhakti would feel upset. And that's because we're conditioned by this idea of wanting to be at the top of things to somehow be better. Whereas true spiritual pursuit requires incredible humility and a willingness to embrace the fact that I can actually really be wrong, like as in really big time wrong. So when we speak of this as being the culmination of yoga, it is in this perspective. You know, in the last lot of talks um, that I did for the SIF entitled um, 
yoga, spirituality, enlightenment and God in part three, we dealt with enlightenment and what it means. And in relation to self-realization, it is the examination of my essence, what I am in my essence, what I'm fundamentally made of as a spiritual being. What is my position in relation to other things? And what is my natural function? What is the function of the soul itself, the spiritual being? And of course, the conclusion and the understanding presented in the Vedas and what comes as a result of mature spiritual realization is that I am spirit in essence, aham brahmasmi. I am not the supreme controller. I am not Ishwara. I am by nature dominated. And my natural and by nature, my spiritual nature, I am eternally immersed in love, in spiritual love, in loving service to the highest and most perfect object of love, who is described in the Vedas as Bhagavan. So when we, we also looked at what is God realization and how the highest truth is manifest in three features, again from the Bhagavat Purana, the famous verse that learned transcendentalists who know the absolute truth call this non-dual substance Brahman, Paramatma or Bhagavan. Um, Brahman, of course, is the ocean of spiritual effulgence or light. Paramatma is the localized and personal feature of God that is manifest within the hearts of all living beings. And Bhagavan is the personality of Godhead who resides in a spiritual world or dimension just as we reside now in a material dimension. That this Bhagavan feature of God is supremely lovable. He is the Lord of my heart. He is known as the Lord of love. Um, we will talk a little bit about this in, in relation to the, the process of bhakti, um, simply because many people have been influenced by less than transcendental understandings of the personal feature of God. I mean, I, I was raised as a Christian and God was this rather almost terrifying guy that, you know, if you didn't get on the right side and stay on the right side of him, he will eternally condemn you to endless suffering and torture. And that does not jive very well or is anywhere near the understanding of this supreme personality of Godhead that is spoken of in the Vedas. So uh, when people have these ideas, um, due to having what my spirit, one of my spiritual masters used to describe as a poor fund of knowledge, it's pretty uh, wonderful, a poor fund of knowledge, not very much in the bank, the bank of knowledge, um, that they then um, want to outright reject the idea of a personality of Godhead just because it seems so off to them. So what we will learn is that bhakti is the expression of the eternal serving mood of the soul itself. It is not some um, emotion or mental expression. And unfortunately, this is how it is misunderstood uh, by, by many people. We are talking about realizing the true natural essence, position and function of the Atma, the self, as opposed to 
the idea of some temporary emotional or mental expression. So, of course, that raises the question of what bhakti is not. And I think understanding this will try to, will perhaps make it so that we can have a better appreciation for what bhakti is. So in, in the world today, you'll see that there are many um, promoters of what I'm going to state as, uh, as being pseudo bhakti. And the reason I'm speaking about this is not with any desire at all to be critical of anyone, but I want it to serve as a warning or precaution to the very sincere seekers. You know, in our spiritual lineage, our spiritual teachers really make a point of trying, the, of the need to actually separate substance from shadow. What is real and what is unreal. And it is really important because if we are not able to make this distinction, we will easily mistake the shadow for being of substance and in this way can become misdirected or misled. So I'm going to just speak about three categories of people that speak about bhakti or reference bhakti, but what they are speaking about is not actually bhakti. They are as like as far away from the reality of bhakti as you can get. The first are a category of people. They are, um, I'm going to use the term sensually absorbed, meaning that they really see this world and this body and the way in which I can enjoy my senses and enjoy sensual happiness, which is only temporary in nature, has been really important. And while they may have this characteristics, they will be promoting themselves as being highly spiritual. And so you see these situations and it occurs so often, it is so tragic where you get so-called great spiritual personalities who speak what is promoted as very high philosophy and at the same time simply seeking to accumulate personal wealth and influence, engaging in sexual activity with disciples or followers or in so many different ways using and or abusing people, innocent people. And it, of course, becomes a big shock to someone who has developed an emotional or sentimental attachment to someone they're seen as a great spiritual personality and offering their life to them. It's like when I become so invested, so committed, even when they do something wrong and I feel in my heart, this is not right, I don't reject them because of my, this it is this emotional commitment I've made, which is not part of the process of spiritual discovery. It is not a spiritual process to make an emotional or mental or sentimental commitment to anything. So uh, there's a vast number of these people and sometimes they have hundreds of thousands, even millions of followers. But in their personal life, they are still very sensually engaged in this world. Um, my initiating spiritual master would sometimes give the example of such people posing as great philosophers. He said, sometimes you look in the sky and you can see a great bird floating on the currents, looking so majestic and just like floating through the air and one feels very inspired by that. But if you look a little closely and consider, 
you will see that it is perhaps a vulture. And what it is doing is has its eye fixed on the ground looking for a carcass to consume. And so you see this often in, in certain quarters where a person is posing as a teacher of spiritual philosophy, maybe in a religious institution or a seminary, or maybe in, an, in the academe. And while they're spouting high philosophy, all the while they've got their eye on the crowd scanning, who can I take? Oh, very beautiful. Yes. And looking to establish relationships with a view to exploiting individuals. When people have this consciousness, and there is a vast number of spiritual pretenders that fall within this broad category. If you are sensually absorbed and you see this as being, this is what's driving you in your life, adding a so-called spiritual veneer to it does not make you a transcendentalist. And so those who have that attitude and say they are engaged in bhakti, they may be engaged in the very preliminary stages, or they may not be at all engaged in the process of bhakti. The second category are those that I'm going to broadly call impersonalists, those who are deeply committed to the idea or the philosophy that the highest truth only exists in an impersonal feature. When people have become very influenced by this type of, of understanding or misunderstanding rather, um, and this is very common amongst the followers of Shankaracharya or Adi Shankar, they promote the idea that any incarnation of God that what that is, is that it is an impersonal energy that has been reflected off a mirror of illusion, Maya, and manifests as a personality. And this happens, they say, such personalities they accept are spiritual and spiritually influential. And they will say that incarnations of God are like this. And they come to this world to encourage the sentimentalists and the soft-hearted towards a higher truth. And so such people, they see that any, the form of God, Bhagavan, the impersonal feature of God is not being an eternal reality. And any connection with such a personality or an idea is simply an undertaking by someone to help them advance spiritually, but later they will throw this idea away and now merge into this ocean of light. So for such people that promote what they say is bhakti, if they adhere to this philosophy, what they are saying is that bhakti is not the natural function of the living being. They have become completely stuck in the idea of my essence as being Brahman and cannot or do not progress to f have a better and more complete understanding of my natural position and function. So the third category are people that engage in worshipping what they say are different forms of God and cultivating a mood of bhakti. And it becomes probably people in the yoga community and, and, and amongst followers of Hinduism, they become familiar with this idea of, for instance, shakti, what's called shakti worship. Shakti literally means energy, and they are speaking about a divine mother, 
of all creation. And this is usually manifest, this Shakti or energy, in the forms of Durga and Kali. Durga and Kali, it is true that they are Shakti, but we should understand that Shakti, meaning energy, if there is energy, there is also an energetic. In Sanskrit, this is called Shaktiman. It is true that Durga and Kali, for instance, are, are manifestations of the, this Shakti of God, but it is also called the Maya Shakti or the illusory energy that is manifest within this world and in relation to this world, not what is beyond this world. If I develop an affection towards the Shakti of God, it is not the same as Bhakti because it is not an expression of my eternal mood of love and service to the Supreme. My fascination or commitment to Shakti is because I want to succeed in this world. I want to materially succeed and prosper. And so I engage in this worship in order to acquire things, to acquire ability or talent or money or power or to enjoy this world. And this world has nothing actually eternally from it, the eternal perspective has nothing to do with my eternal spiritual nature. So we cannot say that I am cultivating bhakti towards Durga and Kali, for instance, but there are also other manifestations of, of the Lord's energy that is manifest for the purpose of bringing order to the material creation. But if I try to develop a relationship with this energy in a mood of devotion, it is not spiritual in nature, it is material in nature. So if I think bhakti um, is manifest by someone who is sensually absorbed in this world, who is interested in sensual enjoyment, this is not any expressions they manifest are not actually pure bhakti. For those who have clinging to the impersonal feature of God as being the only and truth and the ultimate truth, such a person cannot also experience nor practice actual bhakti because we are denying the ultimate relationship between the eternal living being and his natural function in connection with the manifestation of the highest truth as Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. And then of course the third one which we just um, spoke about. So this is a very um, huge subject and this introduction, trying to do this in a short period of time is an extremely difficult endeavor and um, but I, I as we progress through this uh, series of talks then hopefully it will become uh, clearer to the sincere seeker. So as I've stated in speaking about this and going forward from here my humble endeavor and I accept my grave imperfections, my humble endeavor will be to hopefully to provide at least some basic and authentic understanding of this wonderful subject um, dealing with bhakti. So th thank you very much for joining us today and I invite you to um, join us in a uh, kirtan meditation using the mantra Hari Bol Nitai Gor Nitai Gor Hari Bol. Hari Bol Nitai Gor Nitai Gor Hari Bol 